Now the next context is robots or automation. How we automate various processes using devices that are programmed to do various things. Now the simplest of these used in schools would be the Makey Makey. These are simple interface uh, boards where you can then connect up some wires and create circuits where students can then have data feed into the computer and have various things occur on the computer. So for example, if a circuit is completed, um, you could have two wires going into a banana or hold a wire and hold one of the wires going into the banana. And if you touch the banana, you could then program the uh, computer to play a musical sound. And by putting a number of items of fruit out with wires going into them, you can create a musical uh, instrument um, using these various items of fruit. So that teaches students about the concept of input of information into a computer. Now then we have more, um, slightly more complex devices that, um, such as the Adafruit and the Microbits. Now these are little circuit boards that can be programmed so they don't need to rely upon a computer. Normally we program them on a computer then we download the program onto the um, devices and they can have lights on them so we can have certain input outputs happening so we can have it display various messages and different light patterns. So they can also make some sounds but they can also have various inputs. They generally have a couple of buttons and again we can attach various wires to complete different circuits so we can make um, devices to um, detect light and then activate a motor that will release some water to water a plant at um, dawn or an alarm system. So various simple electronic um, applications where students can solve problems by creating automation programs that react to various inputs and produce various outputs. Then we have slightly more complex devices um, that are essentially small computers, uh, microcomputers. Now these are the um, Adrenos and the Raspberry Pis. So they're a little bit more expensive now and they essentially are little computers. You can attach a screen to them, you can attach keyboards and mice to them and program them and run various items of software on them. Now not full-blown items of software such as we would have on a normal uh, microcomputer, but certainly enough to solve a whole range of problems. Typically, um, say, for setting up a weather station, having a whole lot of input devices and then processing that, and um, they can be connected to the internet and run as small servers. And a lot of schools use them with um, Minecraft so that students can run their own Minecraft servers and then connect to those with their computers. And rather than have a, a server running on any of the um, larger computers in a school, they can have a small little server environment and learn about how to run servers. Now, some of these can involve um, connecting of wires and so forth, which may involve some soldering and things of that nature. And it gives teachers nightmares, the thoughts of year nine students running around with soldering irons. So there are some alternatives where they have pre-soldered uh, little magnets and you can simply just click everything together with um, magnets. These cost a fair bit more, but they certainly get around some of the issues and the finically technical aspects of using um, electronic components directly. So this leads us then into automation and Internet of Things. So the idea that we can now have information coming in, we can act on that information by activating motors or lights or sending signals out over the Internet and so forth. There are a range of then activities and problems that students can solve around that. Now, one of the useful tools when we have devices connected to the internet is If Then Then That, which is a software service where you can program it to react to various um, devices and um, signals and inputs and send various outputs. So at the simplest level, you can have it so that every day on your birthday, it will send you an SMS message um, congratulating you on having survived another year. Or you could set it up so that when you receive an email message, 
if you've got a um, internet connected light, you can have your light flash when you've received an email message. Um, so there's a whole range of different problems that can be solved and automations that can be conducted when we have things connected to the internet and we have various software and tools that we can program to have them do different things. Then we have more traditional robots and we start off with robot arms. Um, generally they're fixed and they have a certain degree of freedom which depends upon how many motors or actuators they have to be able to do things. A plotter or a 3D printer is a robot arm that moves around and within a certain constraint. Uh, more traditional robot arms have more degrees of freedom and they can mimic human arm movements. And one of the activities we often do with our students is to create that using cardboard and pneumatics, um, air or liquid in syringes and plastic tubes so that we can move the, plunge the syringes in and out and we can have the robot arm move up and down and left and right and rotate depending upon how many uh, syringes we have and how many degrees of freedom we've built into our robot arm. And some schools have um, full-blown robot arms and they can use those to automate various processes. But in the main, probably 3D printers are where we see that the most, but also plotters and more traditional printers as well. And then you've got CAD CAM machines in workshops that can be used for more industrial applications. And then we have mobile robots, and these have become very popular in education, where we have small robots that can be programmed and can move around and do various things. Now, the simplest of these is probably the Spheros, uh, based on a little mobile ball, similar to what you would have seen as BB-8 in the Star Wars movies. But it tends to be fairly inaccurate. Um, so while it can be programmed to move around, it's not necessarily the most accurate in its movements. So it's a lot of fun. Um, Sphero painting is a, lot, is a fun activity where students program it to move around and they coat it with paint and it moves around on a canvas and they do some artwork. So there, there are a range of fun activities you can do with it. Light painting is another one where we have a dark room and we use a, um, a long exposure camera and we have the Sphero move around the room and change its lights and so forth and it creates a light painting. But in the main we tend to move towards the more uh, complex robots that particularly the Lego and the Mindstorm, uh, the Lego Mindstorms and the um, VEX robot kits. These are where we can have lots of different um, motors and sensors and we can put them in different configurations and construct various types of robots and students can then program them to do various activities. We'll discuss some of these in the tutorials, but there are a whole range of competitions that students can get involved in from sumo competitions and dance competitions to rescuing people from simulated burning buildings um, through to playing robot soccer. And these are all activities that are commonly done well, down here in Queensland. I've had students do all of those. And there are more and more competitions becoming available every year. And it's again a great way of motivating students to get involved in coding but also learning more about the hardware side of computers and the technical aspects related to that. And in the tutorials you'll be exploring some of the simulations, the online versions we have of these where we can do um, activities in a virtual environment with robot kits. But we can also use straight electronics and construct robots from motors and microcontrollers. As I said, with even the simplest micro bit um, circuit board, we can attach motors to that and we can program it for those motors to run for certain distances and turn one motor on and one motor off, have it to turn and use basic electronics to create quite complex robots. And there are dozens and dozens of sensors that can be attached to those. And we can have our robots perform a whole range of real world activities, including industrial activities that you may find in some farming communities or industrial towns. And then we have the more humanoid robots. Um, when I was teaching, we had a robotic dog called an ABO. And we were able to program that and um, it, was, it engaged the students very effectively in learning about programming. Now we have more humanoid robots, such as the, uh, the NOW robots, where they have arms and legs and can, and can walk. And fairly soon, we'll also be having full-size humanoid robots 
and that will again take another challenge in schools and in teaching of robots where we can have the robots perform a whole range of tasks that humans can perform. So think around the different types of robots and how they can be incorporated into your teaching. Now the final type of robot um, moves not just on the X and Y axis, the horizontal plane, but also the vertical plane, the Z axis, and we call these drones. Now, two main types of drones used in schools, ones that fly, go into the air, and those that submerge under the water. Um, and they're being used in a number of schools as well, where we can have the robot then move around and perform various activities in the air or under the water. But essentially, they are just the same as a normal robot. We program them to move around. They may have grippers that can open and close and pick up things. They've got various sensors that can be used to detect things. But what it has to be is programmable. If it's a remote control drone, then it fits into the area of toys. Um, so it's not a robot per se. But if it's programmable and students can program it to do various tasks, then it can be used effectively in teaching digital technologies. And many of them have a nice drag and drop interface such as Blockly and Scratch, and we can program them that way. Some of the more complex advanced ones have their own programming languages where you can set waypoints and various reactions to various events, such as if it loses power or if it detects different things and different things will happen and so forth. So I encourage you again to think about how you might be able to utilize drones. Key thing though is that if you're doing them inside, inside a building, there's no real concerns other than normal uh, workplace health and safety issues. Um, but as soon as you use drones outside, then they fall under the rules and regulations of the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, CASA. And the key requirement there is that drones can't be flown within 30 meters of someone else, which makes them rather difficult to use in a school environment. Not impossible, but difficult. You also have to remember they can only be flown um, within line of sight. You have to be able to see the drone at all times and a few other things. Now, there are ways of getting beyond these uh, restrictions by forming a drone club at your school and going through training processes. And some schools even take the, um, the step further of giving students drone licenses and going through official um, drone training programs, which allows um, them to use drones in a whole range of other spaces. The other big thing with drones is you have to check whether or not your school or where you're planning on using your drones ha is in a restricted flight area. So anywhere near a hospital or an aerodrome or another space such as here on the Gold Coast, um, the SeaWorld area, where they are flying helicopters or planes, then you can't use drones within a certain distance of those. And CASA provides a nice app where you can see um, the overlay of these restricted areas um, and choose where you can fly the drones. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get around those again. Um, I used to do a lot of rocketry with students and the school was right next to an aerodrome. And we had, had to um, get in contact with CASA and with the airport and arrange for when I could, my students could fly their rockets. And it was a simple process. And they were, they were keen to have the students um, engage with these activities, but we just had to go through the processes of ensuring that we could do so in a safe way. And the same applies with drones.